Are you curious about New England Asters? Then watch this video. In late summer, as kids return to school, many people will begin to think about fall and, you know, they'll start to just consider summer and its flowers a distant memory. But nature has a way of showing you that the growing season isn't quite finished. And in much of North America, one can be treated to an awesome display of purple daisy-like flowers in the form of New England aster. This is arguably the most popular native aster, and it's one that I've grown for over 10 years now. I'll be showing you a complete profile on this flower, and I'll tell you all that you need to grow it, including what it is and why you should grow it, identification, how to differentiate it from other plants before blooming, the growing conditions, how to grow it from seed, save seed, wildlife and landscaping, and then we will review. Now the landscaping section will be important as this plant can be tricky to grow in open flower beds and keep them upright and looking good, so I'll tell you all that. But okay, let's have a closer look at this beautiful native flower. Okay, so what is New England Aster? New England Aster is a herbaceous perennial flower native to North America. Scientifically, it's known as Symphiotrichum novae anglae, and it grows three to six feet tall depending on conditions. Blooming numerous purple to pink daisy-like flowers in late summer and early fall, it attracts numerous bees, butterflies, skippers, and is very important for late season pollinators as a food and nectar source. Now, the primary native range for New England Aster is the northeast and north central areas of North America. But pockets exist everywhere from New Mexico to Montana and throughout the southeast, so it's pretty widespread. But like any flower, it has its pros and cons, so let's take a look at those now. We'll go with the pros first. Number one, it is beautiful and showy. And New England Aster is beautiful when blooming. Nobody can argue that. A single plant of New England Aster will produce hundreds of blooms. And when there's a lot of them, the color can just be amazing. Even viewed individually, the flowers are beautiful up close. Pollinators. All those flowers it produces holds nectar and pollen, and the nectar in particular will attract numerous bees and butterflies. These plants are busy when in bloom. Just hanging out near them in the evening, you can find all manner of bee, skipper, and butterfly. Helps monarchs. One other important point on the pollinators is that this nectar that it produces will specifically help monarch butterflies on their migration south in late summer. So even though this isn't a milkweed, it's still equally important for monarchs because they need the fuel to get all the way down to Mexico. Medicinal. So New England aster was used medicinally by numerous Native American tribes to treat a variety of ailments. Decoctions of root and leaves would be used to reduce fever or diarrhea, and a poultice of the root was used as a pain reliever. Tough. This plant is a tough customer. It can survive prunings, deer browsing, and even survive at all but really bad droughts. Okay, now there are a couple of drawbacks that I'm gonna cover here. So first, while I said the plant was tough and could do pretty well in a drought, well, although it will survive, it probably won't look that good from the neck down. Its lower leaves will dry up and be unsightly. So it's not that drought tolerant. At least it won't look good. Second, this plant is a flopper. In the open or in fertile soils, it will lean or flop over, which again is unsightly. Now the bees won't care though, but just be aware of it. And then finally, this is an aggressive native plant. In native plant groups, I have seen comments that said to the effect that aster seeds germinate at a rate of 120%. And I can tell you from my own experience that I think they're right. So this plant can self-seed. Also though, this plant can spread via rhizomes, depending on the ecotype. I will have more to say about this later, but I do strongly suspect that I have some that can spread via rhizome. Now I'm about to get into identification and growing conditions, but I wanted to point out that all the info in this video and more is available in an article and my website. Just search New England Aster, grow it, build it, and you'll find it in no time. So identification. So depending on where this plant is growing, um, it can grow up to six feet tall, according to references. Uh, for what it's worth though, I've personally never seen it over four feet tall. So the, the stalk will be light green in the spring and might turn into a reddish purple later in the season and it'll be covered with small hairs. It's generally unbranched until near the top where the flowering occurs. When it comes to leaves, these are the easiest way to identify this plant before blooming. They're alternately arranged 
and they have no stem or petiole attaching the leaf to the stalk. So you can see these leaves, they're clasping or wrapping around the stem. This is a very easy way to differentiate this plant from goldenrod before blooming. But for leaf size, they're up to four inches long by roughly a quarter as wide, and they're oblong to lancelot in shape. They will have smooth edges or margins, and will get smaller in size as they go up the stalk. Also, when I said the clasping leaves were a good way to differentiate New England aster from Canadian goldenrod prior to blooming, well, here they are side by side. The aster leaves will wrap around or seemingly hug the stem while the Canadian goldenrod leaves are simply attached. So for flowering, at the end of the stalks, clusters of dark purple to pink daisy-like flower heads will form and bloom. An individual flower head is usually one to one and a half inches diameter and there'll be 30 to 40 fine petals arrayed around the central disc flowers. And that is something that's so cool that most people don't realize about the flower structure of asters. These daisy-like flowers, the petals are actually ray flowers and will make a seed, while the center is a series of small disc florets. So all of these will produce some nectar and pollen and eventually make a seed. But when it comes to colors, that's one other thing that's kind of interesting about New England aster. It can range from dark purple to pink. The pink ones I'm showing you here are volunteers from self-seeding, and they make a welcome addition to my backyard microperry. Oh, and the blooming period of this one, it can go up to two months, depending on uh, lighting and all that, so it's a really long, long blooming flower. Root system. Okay, so this is an important section. If you read the references, the root system of New England aster is fibrous and clump forming. And the first New England asters I ever grew came from seed packets from Prairie Moon Nursery, and they behaved exactly like this. In fact, a long time ago, I made a video on how to divide them. In the clumps I dug out of the ground, they looked great and had no rhizomes. A few years later, I saw some New England asters blooming on the side of the road, and they were one of the darkest shades of purple I had ever seen. This place was slated for construction, so I took a few seed heads and germinated and grew them. These, which are New England asters from that, have totally different root systems, or appear to, in that they are growing off of rhizomes. You see this? This is a rhizome from one of those plants and it looks more like a Canadian goldenrod rhizome that would run all over the yard and not a clump forming rhizome. So based on my experience though, the seed I purchased from Prairie Moon produce plants that are clump forming and won't spread via rhizome, but the wild native local ecotype produces strain that, well, it, it looks like it could be spreading via running rhizome similar to Canadian goldenrod. And well, it seems to compete well with Canadian goldenrod as I'm showing you here, so maybe that's just natural. And I could just be totally wrong and this is just a combination of self-seeding and you know, it producing short rhizomes like other references say. So I just wanted you guys to be aware of what I found. Growing conditions. So when it comes to uh, growing conditions, New England aster will prefer full sun but can tolerate part shade. It does best in wet to medium moist soils and it can survive slightly dry conditions in drought. For soil textures, it really isn't too picky and can do well in compacted soils, uh, clay, and sandy loam. If your soil drains very quick or is excessively sandy, you will probably want to monitor the moisture of these. How to save seed. So saving seed from New England aster is very easy. About a month after the blooming period, flower heads will turn into seed heads. And once they kind of look fluffy, similar to a dandelion, you can go collect the seed. On a calm day, you can just go pluck the seeds directly off the seed heads and place them into a baggie. Or you can cut the stalk off below the seed heads and put them into a larger container, then remove the seeds later via shaking or plucking. Make sure the seeds are dry, and then you can store them in a cool, dark, dry place for a couple of years. How to grow it from seed. The seeds of New England aster are easy to germinate, but they do need a cold, moist stratification period of about 60 days. You can do this via cold stratification in the fridge using a paper towel and a Ziploc bag or by winter sowing. My personal preference is always to winter sow as it is just so easy and you'll have seeds popping up in spring naturally. But I have videos on both methods and will leave cards in the top right. But for planting stratified seed or winter sowing, simply get a suitable container and fill it with moist potting soil and scatter some seed on top of it. Press it firmly with your thumb so there is good contact and then place the container in a location that gets morning sun and afternoon shade and keep it moist. The seeds are a bit small so try to mist them so they don't get washed out. This is what the seedlings look like right after germination and then here they are when they're a little bigger. Once they're a you know, two, three inches tall, you can separate the seedlings and transfer them to larger pots or even plant them out in their final location. 
As another way to propagate this plant, as I mentioned earlier, you can divide New England aster early in spring or fall. Uh, just pop it out of the ground and split it with a spade or a pruning saw or a bow saw, then replant the sections immediately. I have a video on this, I will link to it below. Wildlife. Okay, so for wildlife, New England aster is an incredibly important species. Its nectar and pollen feed numerous species of bees and butterfly. I think there's been at least 40 some species of bee and butterfly observed feeding on the nectar. And its leaves will host 14 species of butterfly and moth. No plant profile is complete without talking about deer and rabbits. And New England aster will be eaten by deer and rabbits, especially younger seedlings. So you need to protect those with liquid fence. And if you don't want any browsing at all, then liquid fence will work in my experience for the more mature plants. Also, speaking from experience with deer, they generally won't eat them to the ground, but just the top half. So it's kind of like it in a natural version of the Chelsea chop. Landscaping. And this brings us how to landscape with this plant. There are two main points that need to be discussed, namely water and leaning and flopping. So for water, if this plant experiences some drought, then the lower leaves are going to turn brown and shrivel up. This is a natural response by the plant. Once this happens, the leaves will not come back even if you water. The plant should survive though. Next, for leaning and flopping. So this plant is relatively large at four feet and it has a propensity to lean or flop over. There are three strategies to stop this. First, you can surround it with other tall perennials or grasses. This will give the roots competition and force the plant to grow straight up to get sunlight and not arch over so much. Second, you can do the Chelsea chop to reduce the plant's overall height. I have a video on the Chelsea chop that I will link to detailing exactly what to do. But for this specific species, chop 50% of it off by the 4th of July. And third, you can always use garden stakes to hold it up if you're desperate. So I find the best way for me is to just let this plant run wild in my backyard wildflower or micro prairie area. It's supported by enough of the surrounding plants and grasses so that you don't see any brown leaves, even if they happen because they're hidden by the surrounded foliage. And then they stay upright as well but you will need to determine the best method for your own situation. You know, if you're going to do this one in like a mulch flower bed, then I would say Chelsea chop is 100% the way to go. One last point on the maintenance. You will want to remove all seed heads after flowering to prevent self seeding. These really do self seed a lot, but there are numerous possibilities uh, for companion plants on this. I personally like to have mountain mints around black eyed Susans, purple cone flowers and bee balms. Um, there's various types of liatris that could also do well, and then there's always the grasses. I have big blue stem growing near mine, but little blue stem would work fine as well. You know, really any plant that likes similar growing conditions will do well next to New England aster. But okay, time to review. New England aster is a perennial wildflower with a wide native range in North America. Typically reaching heights of three to four feet tall, it is extremely showy and its blooms feed dozens of species of bee and butterfly in late summer to early fall. And that includes migrating monarch butterflies. It's a popular flower, but it does have a couple of potential problems in that it likes to lean or flop in the open and does not look great if it is exposed to drought. This can be managed by how you landscape with it though. But all right, that's all I got for you. If you got any questions, please ask in the comments and I'll try to answer it for you. And you guys all have a good one.